want to welcome our guests. Uh, we have Sanjay Rawal and um, Alexander Melier. They, the film they have uh, offered us, Gather, is wonderful. You've seen it. It's beautiful. It speaks to so many issues that are pressing right now about healing, community, engagement with the earth, connection we're all yearning for, and also, frankly, facing the climate crisis with the kind of cultural dignity that most of us can only yearn for. Um, I think there are so many lessons in this film for all of us. Uh, it's quite specific to a number of indigenous communities. That's, that's very clear, but we're so eager to talk about the lessons we might tease out uh, more broadly. Uh, what I hope to do at the outset here is uh, ask a few questions that help us frame the film in general, and then we'll take a deeper dive into questions about food sovereignty. Uh, so welcome, uh, both of you. Thanks for being with us. It's great to be here, Greg, and it's great to to be in the same place as Alex. We haven't had a chance to really do a panel discussion together on Gather. And you know, pre-COVID, we worked on this film together for almost three years. So wow. it's wonderful to have the team back together. Oh, that's so awesome. Well, we're, we're grateful you're here. So it's so beautiful to watch this film and see the places. Take, take us into one of those places. Just, just talk us back into a space. Uh, what are you smelling there? Who are you speaking with? Just reorient us to that experience a little bit. Well, you know, on, on the kind of more topical level, I think it's important for people to understand that prior to 1870, the entire U.S. economy was based in the value of the soil. Unlike Spanish colonizers who were looking for gold, Anglo-European colonizers realized the richness of the Native American ecosystem, the Native American stewardship, and quickly turned those farms into plantations, sending the value of the soil and water back to Europe in the form of tobacco, in the form of cotton and other cash crops. And as the US began expanding west of the Mississippi, the economy was still based on commodity crops like wheat, on ranching, on timber harvesting, and the continual need for native land has really fed the entire economic engine of American capitalism. So to answer your question, when we spent time with our characters on their ancestral land, it was with the understanding that as one of our characters mentioned, they were on the other side of the apocalypse. They were dealing with the remnants of cultures that were targeted by the same system that they lived in. And they were basically trying to save their people from the effects of a long-term genocide. So there was beauty, deep, raw beauty in the work they were doing in the soil, but there was a palpable sense of recovery and the process of recovery from pain. Yeah, fair enough, fully understood. And, and we'll get into the themes of healing and, and recovery as you put it. And I know that that's about the landscape itself, as you say, it's about individuals, it's about community, it's about addiction, all of these things. Uh, but I'm sure I'm not alone when watching the film just to be struck uh, Apache country in the mountains and the Klamath River and the high plains of the Cheyenne River Lakota Reservation. Uh, it must have felt like a tremendous privilege to be in these spaces with such people and just to get spend time um, on that ground, learning the stories of these places. It, it really was. As a non-Native, and Alex, of course, is also a non-Native, we wouldn't have dared make this film. You know, knowing the history of documentaries began with a, a film about an Inuit man, an Inuit community, that film being Nanook of the North. And regardless of, of how close the collaboration was with the community, I think it's undeniable that it sparked an industry where those of us with the privilege to buy cameras could then travel to places around the world that we deemed exotic, tell their stories in a way that now indigenous communities generally tend to watch media created by non-natives. So I, I would push that question to Alex because he didn't come on many of the shoots and it was his job to frame the view of the land as a, as a native would, without romanticizing, but with capturing the beauty that we saw all around us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, there's a saying in Ireland, which is uh, you can't eat the scenery. Um, and, you know, I, I think, so on the one hand, there's, 
we shot this film to be a theatrical experience, uh, which unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we actually finished the film in a 4K theater with surround sound and everything. And we had anticipated that the film was gonna be shown in a theatrical environment. So from the outset, when we shot the film, the film was shot in a you know, highly cinematic way. We had a fantastic cinematographer, uh, Renan Ozturk, National Geographic, um, uh, photographer who, who shot the film. And so, but on the other hand, you know, there is a balance to it. So oftentimes, even in, for example, the opening scene where you see it's extremely beautiful in Apache country, but then the character immediately kind of comes in with the context of this used to be green, this used to be, and now because the, we don't get into this story in detail, but because the water has been diverted for mining and the, you know, the, there's so many different, different kinds of problems. So when you look at it from just a, um, a the, you, you know, your first impression of it is, oh, it's so stunningly beautiful. But then purpose of that first scene is to sort of dive in and say, yeah, but here is the place where, you know, this horrible tra tragedy, this apocalypse unfolded. And so it was partly also the work of our amazing, um, uh, composer, uh, Michael Levine, who, who composed this, composed a soundtrack that is very beautiful and sweeping at times, but there's an underlying darkness. There's a dark current underneath it um, because you're, you're, you're seeing something beautiful and you're seeing people recovering, but it's all happening against this backdrop of unimaginable loss. Tell, tell us about how you both came to this project and, and how you chose which groups to feature. I, I love how they come together. Was there a through line that you imagined from the start between these communities? There's that moment, right, where Nephi Craig uh, is talking about the menu at the restaurant he worked at, and he mentions Cheyenne River Buffalo, and he mentions salmon from the Northwest. So how, how did that come together that you have these three communities for telling this particular story and then activating connections to those communities. That's no easy thing. I can fully appreciate the work that goes into that. So if you could round out a little bit for us how, how you came to this set of stories and this set of places. I'll, I'll, I'll start and then I'll, I'll pitch a part of it to Alex. Uh, we were both working on a film together about the world's longest ultra distance running race, 3100 Run and Become, that interwove a number of indigenous stories into a main through line as well. And at that time, uh, a large funder in the native food space asked me if I'd wanted to make a film on native food sovereignty. My first film was a film on farm labor called Food Chains. And I said, no, I said like, this is not my space. I'm not a native filmmaker. This is a sacred topic. And out of respect to this funder who's helped me on other projects, I met one of their main partners, uh, an NGO out of Longmont, Colorado called the First Nations Development Institute. And they have deep connections into Indian country from the work that Alex and I have done. I mean, I knew that to tell stories as deeply as we wanted to, we would have had to spend years in each community, much less try to hopscotch around the country. But to the second part of your question, you know, being a, a visual project, we needed to find places that have photographic evidence of genocide. And so that negated the possibility of really spending time with former and current East Coast tribal nations. Uh, so we had to look west of the Mississippi and we wanted to look thesis wise to areas that face the brunt of US militarization in, a, in perhaps the harshest way in, in, in modern industrial history. Um, the Lakota people of the plains, the Apache people of the Southwest and the unknown decimation of natives in California. That said, in terms of the, the, the structure and the ability to interweave, I was just focusing on emotion. So I would come back from these shoots and say, Alex, it's here. It's like, we've got the emotional through points that, that I know we need for the movie and uh, you got to turn it into something. I mean, there's, there's a process in, in documentary filmmaking in films like this, you know, that we call casting. Um, and you know we often shoot a lot when we cast. And this is one of those projects where in the beginning we had many more stories. This is, there was a lot of material on the cutting room floor. There were many, many more stories. Uh, and 
what started to kind of happen is that it's, there's a type of a documentary film to back up. There's like, there's a kind of a way to approach this topic where you could really try to fit as many stories of food sovereignty as you possibly could and to create this like much wider picture of you know different tribes and different stories. But what started to happen is that we started to realize that if we could, because as storytellers, we understand that a film is gonna have more power if it has an emotional, visceral reaction. If the audience can, can re, you know, identify with a character and, and feel something from your film, they're gonna walk away and want to learn more about the topic. So you're, you know, you're, you're better off to try to tell a compelling story. And so what ended up happening is that as the footage started coming in, and Sanjay would come in and he would sit on the couch in the editing room where I'm tearing my hair out trying to figure out how we're gonna put this massive film together. And he would be like, this, there's this story, it's amazing, it's about recovery, it's about, you know, um, uh, you know, it's it's about people who is you know who are breaking through stereotypes and you know, it's about science and it's about climate change and it's about all these amazing things. And so we started to see, oh, if we if we kind of create if we start shooting around the context of these main characters, um, ne Nephi Craig and Twyla, you know, who to me is really, if the film had a soul, I mean, she's the soul of the film. Um, and of course the incredible story um, of, of Elsie Dubray, which was just, that just happened. And we, you know, we, Sanjay was, I wasn't there when they shot that. Sanjay was there when she actually did win the science fair, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and so you start to see how there's this, all these stories have an arc. And so it started to feel to me like, how do we, how could we do this in a way that it's almost like our characters are sitting around a campfire and they're all telling their stories. And they all, their stories are all completely different, but they're telling their stories and they're sort of feeding off of each other, you know? And so I think like one way to make a film like this is that you you can try to establish in the beginning a sort of way for the audience to understand how you're going to tell the film. And that is why we sort of created in the beginning this sequence where we have all you know three of um, the main stories introduced with all their kind of backstories at once. And also to do it in a way that is only driven by the words of the characters themselves. So we decided not to use talking heads. We decided not to use um, academics. Um, and uh, we decided to let the characters tell the story of their own subjective reality um, and leave the objective reality of it to Wikipedia, basically. What did you, what was unexpected about the materials you were working with, the people you were engaging? I mean, you surely had a narrative in mind going into this. What, what disrupted that narrative? What, what um, challenged your confidence? So forth. Uh, tell us a little bit about that learning and relearning process, if you would. I mean, I, I would add that the entire film was a risk from the outset where we, didn't travel to a lot of places with the film crew. We went and did a lot of development work and meeting people. And Alex's, Alex's better half, his wife, Tanya, was our producer. And Tanya and I basically chose the characters not based on any sort of subject matter criteria. We knew that they were experts at what they did by virtue of their place in their community. But I was thinking about how they would be able to reflect their consciousness through the camera. It was really like a casting for charisma. And of course, that's got nothing to do with body type. It's like certain people just have it. And so we use the combination of, do they have the respect in the food space? And do they have the, the charisma for the camera? Our young Europe man, Sammy Jensob, hadn't even really started the ancestral guard yet, but I met him on a beach in Northern California, in, in Mendocino, Fort Bragg. And I, as soon as I saw his curiosity and his youthfulness, I mean, I knew we had to find a way to get him in the movie. And so we basically set up scenarios with our cast members. Like with Sammy, it was like, let's go spend the night up on the river. And these were really challenging things to produce because we didn't want to pre-produce, but we wanted to also try to control as many variables as we could. Elsie, for example, you know, we wanted to show her in a competitive setting. And of course, that was a science fair. We couldn't predict the result. 
Nephi, we obviously knew that he was, he had the dream of building a cafe on his reservation, but it was extraordinarily challenging for him. And frankly, we finished filming in early 2019, but we had to wait till his cafe opened in January, 2020 to lock that final scene. So for us, the entire story was in flux until the moment that it wasn't. And all of our funders, all of our partners, even our cast members um, had a lot of trust in our ability to have a vision and stick with it. There were many points where we could have said, oh my God, we need to go back and like interview a ton of academics, a ton of lawyers, make this into a, a historical film because we don't really have the story threads, but we stuck to it in a way that I think a lot of that a lot of documentary filmmakers, you know, really really enjoy. Um, take a big risk and hope it pays off. Alex, did you want to add anything there? I think that that's a very apt description of um, what we've done here. I mean, I, I think that um, what brings both Sanjay and I together in from the beginning is that we both have a you know very strong background and interest in films about human rights. Sanjay did his film called Food Chains, which actually did also, he also was working with in, indigenous people. Um, and my back, my before I started making feature documentaries, I was working for the United Nations in Southeast Asia. And I had a background, you know, in all, was working all over Indonesia and in uh, Timor-Leste and had a lot of interactions with issues re in, in, uh, regarding post-colonialism um, and um, post-conflict situations and work with indigenous people. And so I think what we both understood from the very beginning, you know, is that we, it was really, really important that we chose the people who could tell their own story in a way that people could resonate with people. And I, and I, I think for me, the thing I was always looking at too was how can we find a story that can break through the stereotypes? I mean, we knew that the film was really intended for Indian country, but we also wanted the film. We hoped that the film would be seen by non-native people and appreciated by it. And now we see that that's happening and that's very exciting. Um, in fact, that in terms of the story of the film and how I was saying that we framed the beginning of the film in terms of telling people how to watch the film, how to understand the film, that's part of the reason why we started the film very early with the scene and stone barns with all the with the young farmers conference yeah. because that's kind of like we noticed it noticed in that scene that we never let any of the participants in the conference ask a question or make a comment we let nephi drive that scene and he's explaining to you if you're a non-native this is how you're supposed to watch this movie and how you're supposed to understand it in a sense um so you know we just really were focused on letting people tell the story their way yeah, no, I think that comes across so powerfully well, and and you draw the viewer into the community. I mean, I just wanted to hang out with Clayton and Nephi and Twilla and and the crew. I mean, the just the way they inhabit their space, the way they engage one another, kind of the frank honesty. I love the story Clayton tells of uh, food sovereignty. I didn't know what that was, and then guy from Brown comes and is talking all about it. And he says, "Oh, okay, so that's what I'm doing." Now I just live and dream it. Uh, you know, I'm butchering his words, but that that frank assessment of what was happening and his kind of enthusiasm for that so so captures what you're you're telling us here. Um, building on that, tell us a little bit about your your sense of the reception of the film. Of course, it came out during the COVID era. We talked earlier about how distribution of it wasn't quite how you had planned, but what kind of feedback are you getting? Are you heartened by that? Um, uh, yeah, just say a little bit about reception, please. Well, re releasing independent documentary films can be a real chore. With our last film, uh, 3100 Run and Become, we released theatrically in 20 cities across two months, and I was at almost every single opening. And it was exhausting. And, you know, we couldn't bring the incredible indigenous cast of that film and the international cast of that film to more than one screening because of travel costs and logistics. We finished this movie just before New York City post-production houses were closed due to COVID in March 2020. And, you know, we immediately knew that the only options for this film were going to be digital, you know, iTunes, 
um, Amazon, et cetera. But in the meantime, we knew that there were a lot of tools being created to, to replace traditional movie theaters for the time. And a lot of virtual screenings would be planned. And we ended up doing more than 400 virtual screenings from September, 2020 through January, 2021. And we did almost 200 panels with our cast. And so, you know, we, as Alex mentioned, we made this film for a Native American audience. And so we didn't really put in historical context about genocide because that's different for every single of the 574 federally recognized tribes. We didn't define historical trauma, you know, ancestral trauma, even food sovereignty, because these are living realities for a lot of native nations. But that's also made the idea of doing panels a lot more interesting and exciting, rather than talking about the lenses we used or the, you know, the, the way we got our funding. You know, people were, you know, sincerely interested in learning more about the character stories, and we could pipe them in through opportunities similar to this. And so the reception's kind of been beyond our wildest imagination. And as a result of kind of proving ourselves as a very non-traditional commercial film out to a commercial market, we were able to get uh, a Netflix distribution deal later this year. You know, I didn't realize they offered contracts as low as they did to us, but for us, it's an impact. It's like 20 times more people will be able to watch the movie now. I just want to say that for me, I think one of the most rewarding things was like having, you know, in the very early stage of the film, we, we had the opportunity to, um, uh, when before the film was really finished, we had the opportunity to show the film uh, to people who were really working in the Native uh, American food sovereignty space. Um, and that was a way of getting some, getting a feeling for how people are going to react to this movie. And when we showed people the film in that context, and um, I was able to meet Twyla and meet Elsie, for example, and get hear their reaction to the film, that to me was the most meaningful, um, you know, uh, uh, thing so far. You know, that meant so much to me. So that we they that they think that we got it right. Yeah, no, that means the world. I get that. That that's fantastic. And you know, sometimes we scholars, because we so abstract what it is we write about, uh, we're at a painful remove from the people we've worked with, and they sometimes don't recognize themselves in our work. And so, to have the opposite experience, I can I can so appreciate uh, the impact. So, thank you. Well. I'm going to segue a little bit to a uh, bit more focus on food sovereignty issues and some of the ramifications of the film. Um, if I might, I'm just going to say a few words about how I understand it in the place I know uh, best, uh, Hawaii, and kind of curious about your reaction to that. And then I'll try to draw out some other themes from the film. So I started working in Hawaii about 20 years ago. And one of the people I first uh, spoke with there in the field is a gentleman named Maka. And he's a longtime farmer uh, of taro or kalo, an ancestral plant that means so much to native Hawaiians. And he, he was talking, we walked through his taro patch and he was telling me about how the plants really are a kind of ancestor, a sibling, a conduit to the deities and so forth. So I could immediately understand as a scholar of religion how how profound growing these plants would be and consuming them and so forth. And he really emphasized that this was really the continuity with the past that we were looking at. But he also said, it's also the avenue to the future. And that was the part I struggled with. I couldn't quite understand what he meant in that moment. Because you know, you walk around Hawaii, you see principally golf courses and monoculture crops, sugarcane, pineapple, whatnot, not, uh, lots of uh, native Hawaiians in taro fields. So I struggled. Fast forward 2015 on the slopes of Mauna Kea during the protests over the TMT project uh, in the protest camps, right? The camps relied on donations of food. And sometimes this was just pizzas from Costco or whatever, you know, you get. But when people would bring up aipono or traditional foods, People lit up. It was celebratory. It was direct engagement with culture. It was a moment of reverence. One could just see this. And I could see, and this is where the lesson hit home for me, the little children loving their local foods, choosing those local foods, knowing what they were, naming them in the traditional names in a way I hadn't seen before. 
And that really cued me to the momentum of the movement and to realize there are people like Ruth Alawa. She's not at Stanford. She's not speaking at Yale. She has no Cafe Gojo, but she gets her hands every dirty growing things. She's fishing. And there are a whole lot of Ruth Alawas out there just making it happen. You know, their bank accounts are drawn down and everything else. But it's this movement that's pushing back on monocropping, on GMOs, on pesticide use. And lo and behold, it's really taking, taking hold in Hawaii. And I can see from your film and other resources I know about that it's true also in Indian country. So in the way it articulates with broader conceptions of sovereignty, it's kind of a functional sense of sovereignty. That is whatever jurisdiction the nation state may or may not recognize by way of these peoples. The fact that they get down grow their own food and consume it, share in their communities. That's a kind of lived sovereignty that bespeaks so, so much. So that's how I'm really beginning to understand these movements. Um, so I'm inviting you to say a few words about how you began to understand it in these different communities and what you're learning on the road as you uh, tour the film around, well, virtually, and get feedback from different communities. I'm assuming you're hearing similar stories, but I, I'd love to just hear more about that. It's a great set of, of questions and issues. Um, you know, there's 574 federally recognized tribes in Alaska, Hawaii, and mainland United States, and a, num a number of others that haven't gotten that important political stamp of approval for various reasons. Food sovereignty means something different to each of those tribes. Um, they were all at one point prior to contact so deeply rooted in specific places. And out of that came an incredible reliance on Mother Earth and in-depth knowledge on how to read cycles. And that was not just through traditional Western scientific methods, but through ecology, through native science, through spending decades in a particular place to learn the rhythms of it. And out of that came culture, uh, and out of that came spirituality, you know, an innate connection to the gifts that the creator were providing human beings uh, physically and spiritually through the relationship with land, water, and the elements. And that can be traced back to each one of our lineages. We've all, we've all come from someplace, uh, with the except, exception of one or two populations, like for example, the Ashkenazic Jews, that were pushed out of homelands every couple of centuries. Most of us can trace ourselves back to ancestors who stayed in particular places for thousands of years. And again, because of that reliance on a specific piece of land, they developed a sense of gratitude and that gratitude enveloped their spiritual practice. Now, imagine the trauma your family feels. And again, we can all relate to this, having been ripped away from those homelands as a number of European immigrants that came to the United States experienced generationally hundreds of years ago, uh, ripped away due to forces beyond their control. But imagine being in communities right now where you're still under the same jackboot, you're still under the same repression that affected your ancestors. And yet there's something that those colonial forces haven't been able to take away from you. They haven't been able to take away from you that which they can't see, that which they can't hear. The things you feel in your heart, the things you knew your ancestors did. And when that's wrapped around the idea of food sovereignty, you can literally connect with your identity through the practice of traditional food ways. And again, it's also an antidote to this new colonial capitalist system that really arose with the supply chains of European galleons going around, taking over countries for spices, taking over hemispheres then for cash crops, and then creating now a grocery store system where people with money can survive and thrive even during pandemics, and people that don't have money don't get calories. And so food sovereignty essentially is a movement of us moving away from reliance on a world where have not don't get to eat and haves do get to eat. A, a reality that was completely foreign to all of our ancestors at some point in time. Yes, yeah, fully understood. Alex, did you wanna to add to that? I mean, I was only gonna say that I think that 
the more I learn. And, you know, for me, making films is always a process of learning. I feel very privileged to have these opportunities to explore these stories and, and these topics. But I think that uh, we're very lucky that the knowledge still does exist and it's extremely precious. And I think that's what we, one of the things that we are trying to portray in the film. You know, it's, it's when you look at, for example, a young, the, you know, Sammy Jensaw of the Ancestral Guard, who basically as a teenager had this enormous burden on himself to, to learn the stories and to learn the traditions. And um, because there are so few people left. Um, and so I think like, we don't specifically talk about climate change in the movie, but I think if you watch the movie, you can yeah. infer a lot about how we're very, very lucky that the knowledge still exists and the knowledge has been passed down. And uh, we'd be even luckier still uh, if we um, could use that opportunity, that knowledge that, that it exists to respect that knowledge and to try to you know, re reverse some of the damages that's, that's been done to the earth. Yeah, absolutely. That that rings so true with my experience and what you say about the the well of knowledge. I'm I'm always humbled by Hawaiian folks I work with when we were talking again about the taro plant, the kalo, and they can recite genealogies going back, you know, 30 generations to the plant. But the, you know, in, in, so many Hawaiians are capable of producing that sort of knowledge just upon request. And it's like, wow, I can't even name my great grandma, let alone the plants she had in her garden, right? Uh, so it, it's, it's just deeply humbling in that, in that respect. Um, and the climate change question that, that is telegraphed through the, the film, but never laid bare, it, it's there absolutely. And I, and I think the food sovereignty movement is such a way for us all collectively to say, how do we step back from the brink? And what are the relationships to the ground beneath our feet that we can cultivate uh, that will pull us away from the disaster we've collectively created here? Um, so I think there's such such optimism in the film in in that really low key sense. Um, I want to just add one more thing to that, just to build on that a little bit, because for ex just for one example, um, when we um, tell the story of the the, the Cheyenne River Sioux and the effort to bring the buffalo back, it, the when you know if you go deeper into Fred Dubray's story, Fred didn't want to just bring the buffalo back. Fred wanted to bring back the entire ecosystem. Right. And so he, you know, he wanted to bring back the wolves. He wanted to bring back all of the ecosystem that was, you know, previously there. And so the battle just to put the just, just to put the, the buffalo back is just the very tip of of of, of the uh, of the goal which is to really restore that ecosystem in which I think, and Sanjay knows better than I do, but I, I believe that, you know, prior to uh, contact, the, you know, North American Plains was, was it the second largest uh, carbon sink in, on the earth? The third. Um, and that was just completely destroyed um, uh, in order to wipe out the, the, uh, the Native Americans. Right. Yeah, that, um, shifting gears just a little bit. So as a scholar of religion, I was struck by how the film opens with an announcement of prophecy. And then towards the end, there's a uh, language in the direction of apocalyptic language and people living in the apocalypse, a trope we hear in native communities quite a bit that, you know, so often uh, non-natives talk about, well, if we're not careful, we'll end up in an apocalypse and native peoples respond, hey, you know, we've been living an apocalypse thanks to you all for quite a while. And the question is, how do we manage that and find our way out of it? But this narrative structure of beginning with prophecy and closing with apocalypse, it, it resonates so much with so many storytelling traditions in indigenous communities. Maybe you both could say a few words about how you came to that narrative structure and um, and what it means for you relative to the film's arc. I, I could try to tackle that. Um, I think that if you, you know, if it, 
one of the great things about making this film from the filmmaking perspective is that the film, the money for the film didn't come from investors. The money from the film came from groups and foundations that wanted this story to be told. Um, and so we were not, and the, and the goal for the film was not to win the Golden Globe. You know, the goal for the film was to distribute it throughout Indian country and then have a wider discussion and a wide spark, a wider movement and that kind of thing. Um, and so we didn't make the film in the way that we would have possibly had to make that film if we were making it for a commercial audience. So we kind of intentionally constructed the film in the reverse of that. So the film starts out in a very, as you said, uh, meditative and mournful way um, and you know, a prayerful way, in a very, hum a very humble way. And we're not even asking, you know, we, we understand that our characters inhabit and fully understand the reality that they're in. And we understand that people who are watching the film are not gonna fully understand the meaning of everything that they're seeing in the beginning of the film, but that's okay because it's authentic and it's real and it sets the tone for the beginning of an understanding, you know? And so I think that that was the kind of the goal, um, you know, with that structure is kind of, and to put the, put, to put the quote at the beginning uh, from Crazy Horse, um, and the, I think for me, the idea was everyone sit down in your seats, you know, and stop rustling your popcorn. This is gonna be a very serious film. So the goal was to get everyone to kind of settle in, not in, as opposed to grab your attention, like you might try to do in a traditional movie. Yeah, well, I think that was super effective uh, as I watched it. Sanjay, did you wanna to add to that? No, okay. No, thanks for that. Well, building on the, the quotation, the prophetic quotation that you open with, the emphasis in that is upon healing, right? And that theme of healing of, of communities, but also of individuals from addiction comes up over and again. Did that surprise you as part of the storytelling um, that, that came out through the film? Or just tell, tell us a bit about that process, about learning about what healing means at so many levels. And I asked this probably again as a scholar of religion, many, many indigenous traditions, the, the centerpiece of their ceremonial lives is about healing um, in, in any number of respects, physical healing, psychosocial healing, uh, healing the earth itself. But that's the primary trope of so many, so much religious action in indigenous communities, as you know, is of healing. But that might have surprised some viewers. And then the way so many individuals in the film spoke about their own injuries and their path to recovery from them. So if you could say a little about that. Yeah, I mean, obviously completely from the standpoint of a non-native and trying to, to channel our characters, you know, Indian country is in a, has been in a place since contact, you know, 500 years ago where it has to talk about healing. But in past projects that Alex and I have done with indigenous communities, they were on themes that had to do more with transcendence and didn't focus on realities that weren't filled with light. So from that standpoint, you know, we didn't set out to drive the narrative one way or another here. And to your point, it was surprising that the older characters in the film of, the, of similar generations, Twyla and Nephi, were both going through a deep physical healing, whereas the younger characters, Elsie and Sammy, while they might have experienced trauma, it wasn't nearly on the level as a generation before them. And they were in essence on a path towards light, understanding that darkness is around them, but not having experienced the darkness of their elders, knowing that it happened, but not having it be a minute to minute reality like sobriety can be. Um, so that said, you know, we really leaned on our executive producers, the First Nations Development Institute, to help us frame some of these issues in ways that non-natives don't generally tend to do. Like most non-natives, and Alex and I struggled with this in the editing room, it's like, how much do we want to show of addiction? You know, how much do we want to show of natives struggling with sobriety? Because we had the footage, you know, it's evident in, in 
some of the worst hit communities what the stark reality of drug addiction, alcohol addiction is. But there's also a whole set of tropes that natives live with as members of the United States. The fact that Indians are lazy, Indians can't handle alcohol, all of these things that have no basis in scientific or moral realities, but things that would trigger biases in non-natives. And at the same time would just emphasize to natives that, oh, this is another one of those films that focuses on all of our problems. So that said, it was a fine line to walk because our characters were living this every day. But again, it's like their focus was on the light, was on you know a goal of positivity. And as long as they kind of stayed on that razor's edge, they could get there. They weren't lo constantly looking behind them um, at, the, at the past that may or may not have been following them. By focusing on what was good in life, they were healing spontaneously. Uh, so it was a very, very, challenging set of issues once this theme became so prevalent. We kind of wanted to run with it, but we also knew that every non-Native filmmaker is just gonna kind of rely on the same set of stereotypes that we're all used to. Yeah, right, yeah. I appreciate the nature of that bind. Alex, please. No, I was gonna say, I mean, there were scenes that, you know, we ultimately felt that we had to cut because uh, we felt that in the context of the way we were making the film, we couldn't adequately describe to the audience what we wanted them to understand from seeing people who were really struggling with addiction in real time. And so it, there was, we felt like our main goal was to, um, we could talk about addiction, we could talk about these kinds of problems, but we decided that very early on that we weren't gonna take cameras into like a kidney dialysis center or something like that. We didn't want to show that. We just felt that we, we just stay on the stories of the characters, let them tell their stories in a very honest way without feeding into stereotypes that people have about, about native people. So uh, it was difficult uh, to um, uh, ride that line. Um, and it was v extremely uh, powerful um, and incredibly uh, brave and um, generous of our characters to talk so openly about the struggles that they had in their past. And we just wanted to be, we wanted to honor that. Um, and we wanted to show them, we wanted this film to be about a film about recovery. So we wanted to show people recovering. We didn't want to show people who hadn't, made that choice yet yeah no no uh and it comes across in the opening of cafe gojo it's uh you can just see nephi is uh i mean with the little baby and all the stressors he's faced in life but that that was a real victory at least as represented in the film and to have uh twilla show up and to have clayton there and it, it just felt good um and and i think it so conveyed that that sense of at least provisional victory, like this can be done. And as he had said earlier in the film, you know, this is kind of going to blow the minds of the community, like an old gas station that's been uh, redesigned and, and uh, you know, serving this food in a way that it, it's a food from the homeland, but it's also done in a kind of fancy style. And uh, it just, I'm just trying to get at the point that you really do convey that sense of people people moving forward and making things happen. And that's what I've seen in Hoi over and again. And that's not to say that uh, there aren't hardships, of course there are, um, but this movement, the way people come together around food, whether they're eating it, planting it, growing, it's just time and again, such a powerful story. Think with us, uh, extrapolate if you would, from the specific context of the film, these three tribal nations, to the broader implications of the possibility of the food sovereign movement, sovereignty movement for the rest of us. I'm thinking about the food precarity that we've heard so much about during COVID times. And Sanjay, you mentioned it, that the privileged still have access to food, but it's become so clear that that's radically asymmetrical at best. Uh, even on campuses as privileged as UCSB, there's a sense that for graduate students especially, there's food precarity. Um, homeless communities, houseless communities, of course, face food, food precarity. And also that sense of the falling apart of, of community itself. 
what are some of the lessons you think that, not that we should always turn to indigenous peoples and take from them their lessons. We don't wanna obviously replay uh, that colonial move, but I think these communities are so generous in my experience of saying, we have something good and maybe you should try it on or at least learn from it. So I'm just asking you to think with us about possible takeaways for the rest of us. Great, great question. And I, I would kind of throw this out, not as a radical solution, but as probably the only solution that hues to our own, I think, belief that the three of us share that native communities have solutions for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're living on someone else's land. We're living in someone else's backyard. And, you know, it's not enough to talk about inclusion um, and give people a seat at the table when folks in indigenous communities should in fact be the leaders of the movements for restorative justice, for earth healing, et cetera. I mean, it couldn't be more of a reality where you guys are, Santa Barbara, Ventura, et cetera, where native communities have dealt with fire. They've dealt with climate realities on a deeper level than communities have, you know, since California was really populated 150 years ago. And it's not enough to ask natives what they, what they want us to do or to have them tell us what we should do or to teach us what to do. It's more important for them to be in those policy leadership positions. I mean, again, that's why, you know, uh, Deb Holland is, is the, the ideal secretary of the interior, the former um, New Mexico Congresswoman, um, Native American, you know, she's in, the position to radically change the way the rest of America treats public land, you know, the relationship between the federal government and Indian country through the Bureau of Indian Affairs under the, the Department of the Interior. So again, it's like, I think it's, it's, it's great that we all study things. It's great that we take inspiration, but the proof of our allyship is going to be elevating natives to the rightful positions of leadership in our society. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, like you said, we're seeing that we hope with the Deb Holland confirmation and then a number of people under her, I understand would be um, indigenous appointees. So many good things could come of this at Bears Ears. We had good news out of Oak Flat yesterday. Uh, I think the, the, the ground may be shifting in these positive ways you suggest. Alex, did you want to jump in on this? I was going to say that now that, you know, that this is uh, happening and, and Deb Holland, I'm glad you brought that up, is going to be um, uh, the head of the interior. I think now we have to say, don't we think that that position should, ha should have historically and should always be held by an indigenous person? Um, I mean, it just makes sense. Um, but what I was what I was going to say is that I think for let's say the Netflix audience, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, another kind of a takeaway too, which is that you know you can be indigenous to your own backyard, you can care about the environment of your your ocean, your beach. I live right by the East River. Um, you know, we can all care about. Um, and start caring a lot more about the earth in our own ways um, and follow that example. Yeah, I'm, no kidding, uh, absolutely. Well, I think on that note, let's turn it over. I'd like to invite uh, Tyler Morgenstern to come on and field for us a few audience questions and uh, then we'll, we'll call it a, a grateful day. Great, thank you. And thank you all so much for a wonderful conversation. Um, just before I ask any formal questions, I just want to draw everybody's attention to um, in the Q&A function, Sanjay um, answered a question for Mary Ince that I just wanted to draw an attention to this response that um, there was a series of stories that didn't end up uh, or that didn't end up in the film, or I understand didn't end up in the film, but have turned into print stories that through various commissions with native journalists. And those stories are available if you're interested in learning more about them through the film's website at gather.film. So if you're interested to know more about those stories that didn't end up on screen, there's a, there's a place for you to go. Um, 
So our first question comes from Arlene, and it's sort of about the longer life of the film or kind of the social life of the film now that it's actually out. So she asks um, if you can give us any updates on the main characters or how actually being in the film has impacted them where they are now and the kinds of work they're doing. Um, and Emily Zinn of the Crisis Bull Center asks a similar question about how things like Nephi's Restaurant is doing or the cafe, given that it opened only a couple of months before the pandemic, which has done so much to change how we inhabit those kinds of spaces. Right, thanks Tyler and thanks Arlene for that question. So we've, we've really focused on two levels of impact. Number one, impact on our characters' lives. And number two, trying to bring more resources into Indian country. Less than one third of 1% of American philanthropic dollars go to native led organizations working in Indian country. And you know, one can argue that the majority of American philanthropy came from fortunes you know, from Indian land. So we've generated, you know, a lot of, you know, almost six figures of grant money for each of our characters, their projects specifically, for Twyla, for Sammy. Um, Elsie has gotten a number of offers for um, post-graduate uh, uh, research funding. When she finishes up at Stanford, she's a junior right now. Nephi's Cafe, you know, we filmed the soft opening in January of 2020. His reservation, the White Mountain, White Mountain Apache Nation was one of the hardest hit areas in the United States because of COVID-19. Um, they had strict lockdown procedures in effect from February of last year onward. Uh, luckily, they own their building, so they're not in any, uh, any precarious, you know, in, in any sort of situation where they might lose the privilege of being of service and they hope to reopen the restaurant sometime in early summer. Um, you both spoke at the top of your of the conversation um, about the kind of difficulty or at least the challenge of sort of representing the stunning beauty of Indian country without either diminishing the gravity of the histories that those lands hold and particularly the history of colonial violence and without romanticizing them as somehow kind of outside um, of the flow of history and the pressures of history in this kind of colonial way. Um, and watching the film, I could really tell that you were, I could understand the effort that had gone into striking that balance and it was really appreciated. But I wonder if you could maybe speak just a little bit more um, about uh, the, the visual language of landscape, um, given the ways that landscape painting, landscape photography, um, has historically functioned in colonial media cultures to reproduce really troubling claims about, say, the emptiness of indigenous land and therefore its appropriability, or to uphold racist ideas about the kind of backwardness or deficiency of indigenous land tenure practices and, and agricultural practices in particular. So this comes up obviously in the context that you work in, Greg, the, the use of the sort of moonscape landscape of the summit of Mauna Kea to justify techno science projects that run roughshod over indigenous sovereignty, right? So I just wonder, given your use of techniques like aerial photography and the, the sort of visual language of the land and landscape, um, how you were thinking about, or were you thinking about these kind of longer histories of representation in your work? That's a great question, and I'll, I'll push a little bit over to Alex, but the first part that I'll address, I mean, we didn't want to use any drone shots. We didn't want to use aerial photography, not because natives, of course, don't prize their land, but because for non-native audiences, it brings up the, the very kind of colonial um, bias and stereotyping that, that you mentioned. Um, that said, we only really showed the land as it as we felt it pertained to our characters. And you know, with a movie like this, traditionally called a tandem narrative, where you know you have a bunch of characters, and in our case, they don't actually intersect plot-wise, you need a couple of elements, a couple of extra characters that do have a presence in all of the stories. And one of the one of the characters literally is Mother Earth. Each of our community members, each of our main cast actually has a very deep relationship with Earth. And that was the reason why we included those images, even in the minimalist sense. But the other character, which looms large, both in the past, present, and futures of each of our characters is death. And so for us, you know, the imagery of Earth was really only important in so much as it was present in the moment that we were shooting with characters. 
the idea of death though is what cinches the whole movie together and so that sort of death isn't really an aspect of the romanticization of native american communities and so we focused more on on the living reality of natives existing now and the forest they're dealing with now as as post-apocalyptic or or this ominous sense of doom trying to block their the achievement of their dreams i mean just to add to that too i would say that i think part of the reason why the aerial photography in our film works in a way that's not necessarily meant to be like blue planet um, is because, you know, it, I think for me anyway, and also in collaboration with the score and with the themes of the film and the kinds of things that we're trying to say in the film, as a sense of timelessness, you know, a sense of humility as these tiny, and um, you know, tiny uh, beings with very, very short lives that live on, in these landscapes. And so you see these epic, you know, landscapes that take a million years to carve you know, and you can start to imagine uh, the um, overwhelming sense of responsibility that we have or should have as stewards of of uh, our of our precious planet. Um, and so that's kind of what I see when I when I look at uh, some of those images. And and I think that's what we're trying to portray at the end of the film, where there's a montage of all these landscapes and we're sort of flying over all the landscapes and Nephi is talking about how there's this movement afoot and we're trying to come back we're bringing these things back we're fighting for our rights for our human rights and we superimpose images of ancestors of the tribes that we are trying to cover so no, because we're trying to show over those landscapes that these are the people who lived and died on to protect this land over courses of generations and generations and generations. And so, yes, it is it's extraordinarily beautiful. It's stunningly beautiful. Um, and we need to protect it. Well, I want to thank our audience, uh, everyone for tuning in. And uh, I want to thank our guests, uh, Sanjay and Alex. It was a uh, great, great conversation. I very much enjoyed it. And I loved watching the film and I'll be sharing it far and wide and teaching it to my students and so forth. So thank you. And, and I look forward to welcoming you to Santa Barbara someday when this condition passes us by. <laughs>